this is a school committee subcommittee meeting of the policy subcommittee. We uh, do have a number of items docketed, but I don't think we will necessarily be talking about all of them today. So it may be a fairly quick meeting. So first up on the agenda is review and approval of the minutes of the October 17th policy review subcommittee meeting. Would someone like to move the minutes? Thank you, Stephen. Is there a second? Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer, your vote? Yes. Valerie? Abstain. Stephen? Yes. And I also vote yes. David, that brings up, can sorry, I ask? Can I just ask a question about the minutes? I read them and I, I approved them, but I, I just wondered if we could maybe um, circle back to some of the items on it and just sort of maybe under new business at the end, just sort of update about like where those things are. Are there any action items that we need to follow up on with them? Um, I was just reading through it and I was like, oh, so what, what is the next step for some of these things? So just a note. Okay. All right, so our next item is discussion and review of the proposed PSB equity policy, the staff recruitment and retention section. Uh, and I wonder if Andy and or Val would like to present this since I understand that the uh, two of you have been working on this and also Stephen as well in the, sub in the diversity subcommittee. Andy's been the lead. Andy, do you wanna? Um, yeah, happy to at least start off the discussion. Um, so yes, this is one section only of the proposed equity policy. Um, and it's been drafted from scratch to try to codify some practices that um, PSB should maybe be following in the area of staff recruitment and retention. Um, so maybe I'll start by just mentioning the feedback that we've gotten on this uh, policy so far and how it's been incorporated into the current draft. Um, so at the DEIJ subcommittee, we worked on this a bit over the summer, um, and one of the major comments there was to have the, um, uh, the recruitment section be less exclusively focused on race. Um, and so the language there has been changed to just make it clear that you know, uh, race is an example of the sort of thing that we're, we're dealing with, but uh, certainly not exclusive. Um, in addition, our um, labor attorney, Liz, has looked at the, uh, the bullet point on how we handle educators who might not have a Massachusetts teaching license. Um, so the current uh, bullet point there reflects her suggestions on how do we keep it legal. Um, for the under, uh, under retention uh, in the mentoring section, I've gotten some sort of general feedback that that may not be cost neutral, um, meaning that we would have to devote some additional resources to providing the level of mentoring that that's, that's called for there. Um, but I haven't been given any specifics on sort of how many additional resources might be needed. So I've kept it in as it is for now. Um, the community building section was added at the suggestion of staff. Um, and if I think Janae was planning to be here later, so I'm hoping she could contribute to a discussion of that section. Uh, I'm not sure at this point whether that goes far enough or perhaps too far in spelling out actions to be taken by, by PSB. Um, that's something I'd be interested in hearing about from this subcommittee. Uh, and finally, under supervision and evaluation at the end, the current draft has less focus on evaluation than the previous one did. Um, this is basically, we need to avoid talking about what evaluation rubrics should include, because uh, we don't want to be trespassing on the evaluation agreement that is between the school committee and the BEU. Um, and so it, it just now basically just says like, anybody doing an evaluation or supervising anybody should be undergoing anti-bias training. So that's, that's where it stands now. It reflects quite a bit of feedback already from staff. Any questions from subcommittee members? Go ahead, Stephen. So two questions. First, where where is the larger policy into which this fits right now? Val, you want to take that one? I mean, there isn't one. Right. This is a this is a brand new policy. So it it's um, okay. Is there is there like a draft outline for what the equity policy is going to look like, or is there a scheduled discussion for that conversation? So we started it, Stephen. If you recall, at, um, at DEIJ. And, and did you that mute your your line? Yeah, sorry, yeah, back I'm, I'm, okay. I'm in, in labs. So there's a um, science we, going on. We started on. that conversation at our first meeting of DEIJ. There had been a couple. Um, 
meetings at policy in the prior year where it came up. Um, but the draft that we started with at DEIJ had both sections, had um, a student section as well as a staff section. And okay. um, so there's a, the, the outlines anyway of a, of a staff, I'm sorry, of a student section that needs to be reworked. But um, Andy, as, a, as our negotiations uh, and vice chair was, was kind enough to take that on so that we at least move the staff portion. I'm not asking with any forward. skepticism whatsoever. I'm just trying oh, to- Oh, no, 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 I just, the, it, it's a brand new policy is the short okay. answer to the, the question. The more specific reason that I'm asking is that opening paragraph, I'm wondering if it's going to be expanded on in the larger policy or not, because I think it's, it's gonna be worth explaining exactly how it impacts student achievement, community and belonging. And I'm wondering whether it's appropriate to flesh that out here or whether there's going to be like an introductory section of the of this policy that's going to describe it more fully, because I think the rationale is worth fleshing out with data. And I'm assuming that's going to take place in the larger policy, so it's not worth having in the retention section, the recruitment and retention section. I mean, I, I would defer to David on this, but we tend not to put that sort of rationale in the policy itself. But, but David's been policy chair for a long time to talk about more broadly. I, I agree with Valerie. Essentially, uh, with any policy that we end up approving, we have the expectation that district staff will then promulgate some procedures for how to implement the policy. And those procedures will spell out some of the details that you're asking. Uh, now, there have been times, unfortunately, to be perfectly candid, where I question whether the procedures were ever promulgated, and that's why it can be useful from time to time to check in on policies that we have already approved, just to make sure that there are corresponding procedures and that they are addressing the elements that are of concern to us. Sorry, I wasn't clear. I, I wasn't actually even talking about implementation strategy. I was just talking about making a really powerful rationale for this policy. So explaining why it's important to have an equity, equity policy, explaining how equity is, is a worthy value and also how equity as a value impacts values like achievement, community and belonging rather than simply assert it upfront so that we more fully flesh out how it intersects with other values. I think it's just worth doing and I think it's worth making as powerful a statement up up front as possible, setting aside what the roadmap is for making this a, a, an effectively administered policy. That that was my only point by making those two comments. I'm not sure if David froze. No. Do, you, do you wanna go Val? He might be frozen. It's right, just on ahead, this. Yeah. So I, I was ahead, just going to say, Stephen, that like from from my perspective, that's better. It, you know, the times that the school committee, like we did um, after the walkouts, have done statements. But that to me is better as a statement rather than a policy that lives in the policy manual. So there can, you know, how we've how we've historically done statements with negotiations with other things that we've done. I guess I would think about that more as a school committee or a subcommittee statement rather than I see. Um, rather I see. than part of the policy itself. I understand. That, that's just that's my perspective. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I was just sort of actually going to echo what Val said. So um, I would really stay away from data in a policy and this nature. And I think a statement would be a good. Um, path if we needed to do that because we want the policy to be sort of like I, I don't know I, yes I'm just going to echo what Val said I liked the way she said it better than what I was going to say um, can I ask another question just about um, the policy um, the one question I had was in the recruitment section um, have have and I know Andy you said there had been feedback from a lot of staff um, and there's some things in here that, you know, that I really liked that were highlighted. I just don't know. And I know we've done a lot of work around in the past for recruitment with um, 
like historically black colleges and universities. And I, I really liked the ad addition of some of the, you know, like tribal colleges and things like that. I don't know if we have sort of a network for that right now. And, and I guess the real, the question that I'm asking is, have we gotten a lot of feedback from like HR that they have the ability or that there are resources out there for them to access? I guess that's my first question. I have a couple others, but does anyone have sort of feedback for me on that? Andy, go ahead. Uh, I think it's more in the nature of, oh, at least uh, Janae has looked at this and has not flagged that as a problem. And if we don't have currently relationships with those institutions, then we should. So yeah, yeah, I just wanted, yes, I agree. I totally agree. I'm just wondering if like, if, if HR is, I guess I kind of want to back up to something that we that has been an ongoing consistency issue, not not necessarily for us, but just the connection between the policy and implementation and just sort of really wanting to like loop into eight with HR. And, and I see also that it's in collaboration with um, um, Office of Educational Equity that we are implementing what it is that we put forth as a policy. And so just sort of giving them the heads up of like, okay, so this is the body of work that we're looking for. And do you, are you working on a sort of a network for that, right? Because as if, as we think about sort of what next year's hiring process would be, we want to make sure that we are set up, ready to go um, for the season, which is really going to sort of open for a lot of educators in February and March. And then if we want to recruit a really diverse workforce, we want to be on the forefront of being able to recruit um, early. Does that make sense? So Jennifer, to answer your first question as to whether we have ongoing relationships with historically black colleges and universities, uh, tribal colleges, et cetera, at least in the context of the superintendent search we did. And so when we were looking for to attract a uh, diverse array of candidates, there was some outreach made to these different uh, organizations. Uh, I'm not sure about the tribal colleges part, but certainly the others. Uh, so to the extent that we want to think of other uh, entities such as these with which we can engage in outreach to try to enhance our uh, diversity recruitment, that's certainly something that's worth doing, of course. Uh, but again, we already do that to some degree. Yeah, uh, I just like that we're widening the net. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, David. I like, I like that the languages includes AAPI, um, LGBT, like there's, it, there's, it's a really broader um, net than we've been specific about in the past. So, which I really like. Um, and I'm just, I guess I'm starting to think about what that looks like and how can we do that. Um, and so just wanting to give people like a lot of um, time to sort of develop those networks if they don't, and maybe they already have, maybe it's already like up and running. I know some of it is, um, I, I guess I'm thinking of like the wider net. So that's just great. I just wanted to know if we'd sort of had those conversations. I see that Janae is here. Um, so um, she, and, and I'm sure she's probably working um, in collaboration with HR. So and I guess I'm just trying to, I wanted to see if there was an answer and it seemed, and, and maybe partially yes. And just really wanting to give HR and OE or, or educational equity time to like get those pieces like really up and running ahead of this. Um, sorry, that was long-winded. That was fine. Uh, just looping back to Stephen's earlier point. Uh, so Stephen, when I was talking about the difference with the policy and procedures where I was going with that in this context, is that sometimes the specific rationale can evolve over time. And we want policies to stand the test of time and not have to be constantly revised. So to the extent that there might be a specific detail or a specific uh, rationale that's in response to an incident that takes place, for instance, that would be something that would either uh, come into our consciousness through a school committee statement or through procedures promulgated by the district. Yeah, I, can I just add on to that point then? I, I realized why I started in that direction. I, I'm actually uncomfortable with the introduction because I think we need to have a broader rationale. The, the rationale in the introduction suggests to me that our grow, that our goal with this policy is proportional representation, which doesn't seem to be to me like the goal. And that because it seems to me that if we achieved proportional representation between our faculty and the student body, 
we would have no more need for this policy, which doesn't seem right. And it also suggests to me that if our student body were to become more homogenous, we would have less of a need for a diverse teaching workforce, which also doesn't seem to me to be right. So I would make a small, I want to propose a small change. And I'm, feel free to push back. And, and perhaps there's something I'm not thinking of right now. So that, so that it, we would say, rather than should broadly reflect that of the student body, should we would change that to should broadly reflect that of the student body and the nation. Because if this becomes a more predominantly white community, for instance, that wouldn't obviate the need for a diverse faculty. We would still have a need for a diverse faculty, even in that case, because our goal is in proportional representation. Does that make sense? Where is the where do you see proportionality in the in the in that section? That's so what if I'm our talking. goal is that the demographic makeup of the educator workforce should broadly reflect that of the student body, that to me suggests that we're aiming for proportional representation between the workforce and the student body. And in the next paragraph also, there's similar language currently underrepresented relative to the community that also suggests proportional representation. That, that language seems to me not quite right. Can I respond to that? Uh, or at least what yeah. I had in mind in, in writing that particular language is uh, really what I had in mind there is uh, AAPI. We have about a fifth of our students are AAPI, vastly disproportionate compared yeah. to the nation. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I feel like that part is important. And if if our if our goal were to reflect uh, the national demographics, then you know we're setting a much lower bar in that department. I mean, I think it's legitimate to say should reflect that of the student body and the nation that they're both constituencies should that we should consider in assembling the workforce. I, I share Stephen's concern, and I think we could uh, edit this language so that it's both a reflection to Andy's point, but also perhaps a reflection of the diverse yeah, perspectives like of our student of our school community because as Stephen is saying if we were to become a completely homogeneous uh, student body which I don't think that'll happen but if we were to become that we would still care about diversity we would still care about perspectives from other groups regardless as to whether those groups have representation in our school community so I think maybe language such as um, the demographic makeup of the educator workforce should broadly reflect the diverse perspectives of our school community and our student body, something to that effect. I feel like the word demographics needs to be emphasized. It's not just about your perspective. Like it, it, it does have to do with what ethnic group you belong to, not to put too fine a point on it. Yeah. Well, I think it's both because again, what if we, for whatever reason, no longer had a lot of Latino students? Does that mean we're not going to want to have a Latin perspective in our schools or to have Latin educators? So th th therein lies a the concern. There's value to diversity regardless as to whether we actually have members of those particular groups within our school community. Another example that's probably more germane to Brookline would be uh, Native Americans. We probably don't have a lot of Native Americans, but does that mean we shouldn't have Native American viewpoint, Native American educators? and we shouldn't make outreach to them, of course we would want to have them represented regardless of whether we have a large number of Native American students. Can I ask Janae for your perspective on this? Is there a way that you would you would approach this? I mean, I really, hi everybody. I, I really hear what Andy's saying. Um, I, I tend to agree. I also appreciate what you're saying too, Stephen. I, 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 I think the demographic piece is really important. Um, and I think as long as it's and the nation, it's I think it's I I'm, I would be completely fine with that. Would you not bother even with and the nation? Is that too theoretical? Um, I, 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 I agree with David, though, too, that I don't know that we're ever going to go to an all white school system. So it's I guess not I a concern that I have. What if there was another pandemic and then a lot of um, students from abroad were withdrew again and our a API population went down a lot, for instance, mm -hmm. would that change? 
that that was the situation that I was specifically imagining. Right. And I'm thinking about it with a Native American specifically, because we're going to have an effort to recruit from tribal colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. We probably don't have a lot of Native Americans in our student body, but to me, that doesn't mean that we therefore should not try to recruit Native American educators. It's yeah. still a very important voice to have, Absolutely. whether we have Native American students or not. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So can I sort of have a middle point of view here, which is, uh, Andy's language, plus maybe the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I, I think going national is a little bit too too much. Um, I, I think our first line is Brookline, but then maybe the Commonwealth is our, you know, it, it is our sort of secondary as opposed to a national demographic. Uh, again, though, I think that in some ways, like right, like you can get just like you can with nation with national you can get bitten in reverse because nationally speaking, as Andy mentioned, AAPI, um, nationally speaking in terms of Native American, I, I think is percentage wise probably less than Massachusetts at this point. I'm not sure, I need to look it up, but I, there are just, you know, there are lots of groups that where I think that we want to maybe reflect certainly Brookline students. And I think, you know, the way that we're looking at this, right, is in response to students saying over and over to us that they haven't had educators who look like them. Right. So I I guess I default to Andy's original language, would be okay with some other broader diversity statement, but I just anything national makes me a little bit nervous for I, I don't know. I think I would also want to run it by Liz just to see if it opened us up in any way to some sort of other federal issue that we hadn't thought about. Right, like does that, I don't know, David, maybe you have a perspective on whether that opens us up under federal statutes as opposed to what Liz was looking at. Well, given that this is saying broadly reflect and it's aspirational, I don't think that it would, but we can certainly consult. I think I'm just getting anxious because of the Supreme Court and affirmative action rulings that are about to, you know, that's that's what's, I think, right now making me nervous on anything that says national as opposed to keeping it more local. I don't want it to be subject to any kind of negative action, I guess. All right, Andy, do you have your hand raised again? Yeah, well, I, would, I actually originally had my hand raised to go back to uh, Stephen's original point about um, giving a broader justification for why we're doing this at all. Uh, I, I kind of, I'm sympathetic to the idea that like, a, 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 it, there sh it should be somehow attached to the policy an explanation of like why we're doing this. Like to, to have a freestanding statement uh, it would be better if anybody looking at the policy could understand what the point of this all is. I also understand that, you know, it doesn't belong in the body of the policy. I'm wondering, is there any precedent for having whereas clauses uh, in a policy? You know, the way in a town meeting, we would have whereas clauses explaining the rationale. Uh, and that way, it's at least, you know, the text is there. Anybody looking at the policy will see it, but it's not sort of part of the policy proper. <laughs> I would be fine with having whereas clauses. Jennifer? I was just gonna, how much more text um, or like how much, how much more depth are folks looking at in terms of adding to this first paragraph, this introductory paragraph beyond the statement that's there about the, for the sake of student achievement, community belonging, what like how I'm just trying to figure out how much more people want to put in are looking to put in that would add, like, add significantly, whether in terms of like volume or depth to this. I'm I'm just not sure how much people are looking to add. Are we talking like a page? Are we talking a few sentences? Or like I'm just trying to figure out what the how much more of a value add that will bring to the policy itself. 
my personal preference would be to move ahead with a, a preamble like the one we have now. I guess I would think that because I wrote it. But um, if we were to add a lot of whereas clauses, it could be sort of at the beginning of an overall equity policy uh, rather than here. That makes sense to me too. All right, any other considerations on this initial paragraph and whether to add some whereas clauses? All right, uh, Janae, now that you're with us, was there anything else that you wanted to add about this policy as a whole and the construction of it, the rationale behind it? No, I, I really like it. Thank you so much, Andy. It's gone through so many um, iterations, which I know is what happens. Um, so I'm just re-familiarizing myself with it now, but I'm I, I'm feeling good about it. Jennifer? Sorry. Um, I am, are we moving? Can I, can I ask a question about retention, the retention and mentoring section? Go right ahead. Um, I am just wanting to, I, I know Andy mentioned this before, but the need for um, the, there's some language in the mentoring section. Um, and I, are we set up for, I, so I, I guess some of my questions really are like implementation and really not something I guess I need to worry about from a policy perspective, but just things that I'm thinking about, like, are we set up for this kind like, how is this mentorship a little bit I mean, I think I know the answer, but I'm saying, how, how is this different than the mentorship program that we have now? And what would we need to do to enact that, which is really a procedural piece. And then under community building, confront and challenge biased, racist, xenophobic behavior at the moment it occurs, especially in group settings, I feel a little like uncertain about what, what does that look like exactly? from a policy perspective, like, or is that an implementation piece? Um, I just don't know that I feel like I, I'm sure of what that, what that means. I think I'm pretty, I, I've gone through like supervision and evaluation and I think that's pretty clear, but the other pieces I'm just trying to see like, what, would, what does that look like? Um, so I guess those are my two questions, one about the mentorship and the other one about sort of like challenging things in the moment. And yeah, I mean, is, what does that look like in our staff really trained to do that work? Are we prepared to do that work? What does that look like? Yeah, so the, the wording in the uh, community building section is largely from uh, Janae's suggestions, sort of lightly edited by me. So I think, uh, yeah, if you, have, if you have anything to add, I, I, it was something I, said at the beginning that I'd like to discuss, which is whether that section is written at the right level of, I don't know what to call it, like we, we want PSB to, to understand that specific actions should be taken, right? And is, is that clear enough what those actions are from the way it's drafted? Yeah, I would, I agree with you, Andy, in terms of like the, the level of the language or whatever there. Um, and so just to answer your question, Jennifer, I'm not sure that it it translates so well at, at a policy level per se, but absolutely when we look at our mentoring work, um, there's a lot that's being done, whether it's with second and third year mentors, with, with um, people who are second year, third year educators, making sure that um, the mentors are in fact of different racial backgrounds, that they are literally, if it's not me going in, it's the pre people who are in those roles doing some of that mentoring that's specific, obviously, to the, here's what you need to know as you navigate the system, but also here's here's what this looks like as a person of color or it, with these particular intersecting identities. So that work has been happening and it's continuing to, continuing to happen even more intentionally, I would say. In terms of um, the other pieces in B under retention, it felt important to think about the work that we're trying to affect when literally coming from an affinity groups leadership meeting where we have all of these folks across the district who are, who are working on leading adult affinity spaces. And so much of that community building has to do with naming, belonging and non-belonging so that these folks will stay. Um, and some of those these people are, um, you know, uh, linguistically diverse or racially and ethnically diverse, but so much of the retention piece is the community building piece. We're doing a lot of work around that. 
And so again, it's it's not necessarily policy level language, I guess, but that's what's happening on the ground here. Confronting and challenging biased, racist, xenophobic behavior at the moment it occurs, especially in group settings, a lot of that is happening in the mentor meetings. A lot of that is happening in the grade level team meetings. Like I could go on and on about ETF meetings and you know where some of that work is happening, happening specifically. And it's one of the things that's helping educators of color or some other um, marginalized identity feel like they're speaking to it and saying that some of what's helping them stay. Again, I'm not sure how it translates in the policy, but that's what we're working on. Valerie? Thanks. Janae, um, can you just speak to which groups we have affinity, or who, for whom we have affinity groups right now? So it depends. Are you talking about students or adults? Adults. For adults, we have two robust sort of pre-K, there's one pre-K through eight AAPI affinity, adult leadership, uh, adult affinity. There's a um, seven through, I'm sorry, a nine through 12 AAPI adult affinity. There's a larger BIPOC district-wide pre-K through 12 um, affinity. Um, there's a Latinx Hispanic pre-K through 12 affinity. There is a queer affinity pre-K through 12 there is a white anti-racist and account accountability um, pre-K through two pre-K through 12 um, groups that are, uh, that are uh, white anti-racist and accountability. We are working to get um, one that's focused on um, sort of chronic health conditions for edu and social emotional, um, but we, we lost a couple of our people who are, are looking to lead those. So we're building slowly, um, but those are our adult affinity spaces right now that we're working on. So on the white anti-racist and the queer, those have to be pretty new, right? Because I, I thought yeah. at the last task force meeting of last school year, there wasn't a queer adult. No, nope, it's brand and new. It's, it's, it's only existed in pockets for adults. So and then how about the, the white anti-racist? It's brand new. Okay. Brand new this year. Okay, just I, just, I just wanted to sort of get a sense of mm -hmm. where we were with some of those. Following up on uh, Valerie's question, do you think it's worth mentioning affinity groups explicitly in this policy? You're on mute. Sorry. I, I, I think they're incredibly powerful. There's such an interest in them. Um, unfortunately, we every time we talk about the ones we have, there are other people who say, well, what about this? What about this? I don't have enough people who are available to sort of lead those spaces. But I, I absolutely, I mean, again, this is, we're really launching in, in earnest this year, even with sort of the, the BIPOC ones. I mean, in terms of for adults, um, so I think it's, I think it's great. In, in terms of the policy though, do you think we should explicitly mention affinity groups because we sort of touch upon it in, in talking about culturally competent mentorship, but it's not spelled out. And given the presentation that we had recently, it was in the context of the heat school, but I thought it was very powerful mm -hmm. about how important affinity groups can be. Yeah, the student affinity were doing great we're doing very well with in terms of adults, we're just starting. So I hesitate because I know that this is policy. You know, I know that this is the expectations. This is something that's sustained. We're literally just getting started. It's hard for me to speak to it. Okay, Jennifer. Um, I was actually gonna say, um, if we wanted to, things are constantly changing and evolving. Um, and so I guess, uh, while I, I really love our work around affinity groups and we're hearing a lot of positive feedback about that, if we want the policy to be timeless, I don't know if we wanna name the specifics of what it looks like right now because it might change and I don't know, it might, might change and develop and grow into something that's different. And if we, we would have to go back into the policy if, we, if affinity groups changed into something else. So I just, so I don't know, it, I could be convinced one way or the other, but it was a thought if we wanted to sort of, if we want the procedural stuff to stay within the district about what that looks like, then maybe we wouldn't. Although, I mean, I, I really am proud of the progress I think we're making in affinity groups. So I'm not opposed to naming it in there, but um, I just don't know if we want to tie like, it becomes policy and it becomes sort of set in stone. So I don't know. I don't know if it 
it changes our flexibility at all. I, I, it's just a, a literally this is like in just thoughts that we're having in conversation. Um, I'm still sort of um, wonder I, the second bullet under community building. I don't know what's nagging me about it, but something is. I, I don't. I don't. I'm having trouble with what that looks like for so for me when i read the first bullet i immediately thought of affinity groups and i'm just wondering what the second bullet sort of like translates into but i i don't know maybe it's not important maybe maybe that's a procedural piece um i'm just thinking that when people read this who aren't having these conversations with us they may be wondering that same thing like what does that what does that mean i don't know i don't know if there's some other way to like add something that gives a little bit more I don't know, maybe we don't, maybe we don't need it. Maybe I'll just stop talking. Okay. Valerie? I was gonna suggest um, perhaps just adding an EG in that first bullet. So EG affinity groups, or you know, for example, affinity groups, just because I, I do think that calling them out is important. And I think that it's a way to call them out without necessarily, right? Is that, is that, Makes sense to anybody, Andy. Yeah, I, think that makes sense. I, I agree with you, Val, and it, it means that if we're not requiring it, it's just an example of what would serve that bullet point. Andy? Yeah, so uh, what are examples of uh, intentional spaces, uh, which is the current language uh, that are not affinity groups? Like, what other, yeah, what else does that term cover? I, I would think it could encompass trainings, uh, conferences, not necessarily a group, but whenever you assemble several people, it might just even be a one-time gathering. But I, I do see your point, Andy. And uh, uh, similarly, if we're trying to sort of be more specific about what some of these terms mean, if we go to the third bullet point, uh, and that one, I, I kind of have similar questions to Jennifer's questions about the second one, which is what exactly does this mean? Uh, you know, targeted support as needed. Uh, is there some way we can be more specific about sort of what DSP undertakes to do here? So for the third one, I think it would be difficult to be more specific because when you're tailoring support okay. to an individual, then it's tied to that individual. Okay. So I don't know how we broaden that part. I do share Jennifer's concern with the second bullet point, just in terms of how that would play out, because I, I don't think that we are intending to create a potentially hostile workplace, depending on how people would confront it. Yeah, some of that plays out in, in the specific PDs that we do, but I you know, completely understood. Any other responses to Jennifer about the second bullet or to Andy about the third? Jennifer? I'm not gonna to respond to myself, but I'll respond to, to Andy's on the third. I, so at first I was thinking provide tailored support to new colleagues. Is that part of, does that really fall under mentorship in the mentorship part there? Is it like a duplication in a way or is it, does that mean something different? Um, because it says new colleagues. So then I'm, there's some language in the mentoring about culturally competent mentorship. So I don't, I don't know. So that's where mine my mind was going specifically when I read the third bullet. I, but if it means something else, I think we should, we should be more specific about it. Or I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how it's different than the mentorship. So that would be helpful if, if we could think about that. I was thinking of it, Jennifer, and you know, Janae can correct me if this is not how you were thinking of it. I was thinking of it as more of, of like in groups as opposed to maybe individual. Like when I was thinking of mentoring, I was thinking of individual mentoring. And when I was thinking of when I was reading new colleagues, I was thinking more of um the, again that community building piece in maybe a small group setting as opposed to what I think of mentoring in a more one-on-one -on -one way, but that's just how my, how I read those two. Yeah, it's, a, it's both. It's definitely more than just the one-to-one -one mentoring. Sometimes, again, if, if you're thinking about sort of 
for lack of a better way of explaining it, but like racial pairings, you don't necessarily have enough mentors who are, who are people of color as one example, right? Who can be a mentor for, for the new um, staff of color. And so sometimes there are group things that happen, whether it's via seed or something like that. There's, again, I think it was general because of the timelessness of it. If we go so specific, then ultimately it doesn't feel super policy-ish, but, um, you know, I'm certainly not married to any of this. Just there's there's myriad ways in which new colleagues are supported, particularly colleagues who are coming from Boston or another district, um, and folks for whom we are working hard to retain. We get super creative about what that tailored support looks like, and it certainly goes beyond mentoring. All right. Any further thoughts on section B? Why don't we take a look then at section C? Any comments or questions? All right, so I think it sounds to me that we certainly have a very good foundation here and thank you very much, uh, Andy, Val, Stephen, Janae and others who worked on this for uh, bringing this to policy subcommittee uh, that this looks Great, but there, I do think there are maybe a couple more modifications we might want to make after having this discussion. So it sounds like uh, specifically adding the EG affinity groups and also possibly fleshing out a little further the second bullet under community building about what confronting and challenging uh, bias, racism, xenophobic behavior at the moment it occurs might look like because I'm just wondering how people would respond to that meaningfully. Does that mean if someone hears something in the classroom that right away they call it out? Does that mean right after the class ends? Uh, it, it's not clear to me reading this how someone is supposed to react. So maybe a, a little more on that one. How do others feel? Jennifer is nodding. Yeah, I, I agree, David. I, I'm that's that's my sort of feeling walking away from this conversation is and I I, I liked the way that you sort of framed that um, for the, especially for the second bullet. I think adding affinity groups as an example, um, I'm okay with that um, or comfortable with that. And then the second bullet, um, I, I just I think it's I think we need to like just work on maybe on the language or explanation or or something with it. And then getting back to the very first paragraph, where did we land in terms of keeping it at student body? Uh, Val's proposed, proposed resolution of uh, adding Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or do you want to keep it as is? Jennifer? Uh, my, I think my first gut was to keep it like, not, not keep, but to like start with the community, with the school community, the larger community. Um, I would I would stay away from, I don't know. Val had, Val just started making me think about like, okay, so what are the implications of this? And like, really what we're looking is to support the students and educators and, and people that are in front of us, right? And, and value and support that. So I, I'm comfortable with, uh, with either, you know, school and local community, or um, let me just scroll back up to the wording that's there. You know, what I really like is broadly reflect. Like, I, I think that that's what we're trying to do is really broadly reflect the, the, the folks who are in front of us, the human beings that are in front of us. So I, I'm okay with the language as is. And if we were going to change it, I would just, I would, I would prefer that we have a slight preference for keeping it local. How do others feel about changing student body to school and local community? I think that that is great. I um, fully support that. And I, you know, I think that it goes a little bit to Stephen's concern because um, I, I think the local community piece can be read such that it, it still covers um, perhaps even a little bit beyond Brookline if that were ever to be an issue, or we could revisit this if that were, you know, for our next pandemic. But, but, but I do think that the intention really and, and what brought us here was students who wanted educators and staff to reflect their backgrounds and, and 
you know, so I, I do think that keeping it local um, makes the most sense to start with. What if we change it to should reflect that of the student body and broader community? We, we already but, have the word broad and broadly reflects. Yeah, and like I'm suggesting community. moving broad okay. a little bit further out. So it should reflect that of the student body and broader community. That, the that why, the, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, David. I, I, I like broadly in front of reflect because we don't want to create the perception that it has to be an exact proportionality. And I think broadly reflect uh, allows for that. Realistically, so it's like that of the student body and, and local community. Is that what you're suggesting? I think so. Okay, that that sounds like an improvement to me. I, I hear, I hear David and Val and Jennifer's concerns. I, I just don't want to. Um, I want to value diversity beyond representation of our student body. I, I definitely share that. Do you think there's somewhere else in this policy? Where that could be addressed, yeah. The, because the to me, equity paragraph. equity goes far beyond the actual representation, but also perspectives and viewpoints. And yeah, I, I think I, I think that will be mitigated by uh, some introductory statement in the policy or a whereas statement or two that that more fully explains the value of diversity with respect to a policy such as this. Okay. Now, I would be comfortable moving this for referral to full committee, understanding that there's more work to be done on it, but for purposes of giving us the opportunity to discuss this at the full school committee. How do others feel? And, and that doesn't stop us, obviously, from continuing to work on this, both at the DEIJ level and the policy level. I agree. All right. So would someone like to move it? I'd like to move it. Okay, is there a second? Thank you, Valerie. Stephen, your vote? Uh, yes. Val? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. And I also vote yes. Thanks, Andy, for doing this work. Yes, thank, thank you. Andy. Oh, thank you all. All right, so next up, I, I want to take this out of order because Trisha has to go at six. So let's move to review of COVID-related policies, uh, staff COVID-19 vaccination policy. So as some of you may recall, the at full school committee, there was some hesitance to rescinding this policy and leaving it at the discretion of the superintendent. It seemed that school committee members felt that there was some value to being very explicit about continuing to require staff to be vaccinated for COVID-19. About a half hour prior to the start of today's meeting, my apologies for that, I sent an email with some proposed revisions, which remove the weekly testing component and also allow for the exemptions for uh, to be for medical or religious to be sufficient without further testing requirements for the very few who are in those categories. Otherwise, vaccination will still be required. Uh, I also added language that instead of it being by the November date of 2021, since we're obviously past that, it would also be within one month of a new staff person's employment with the district. Any questions regarding that update, Jennifer? Um, I'm hoping Trisha can answer this question for me, maybe. Um, I went um, to the CDC website just so I could understand the language that's in the policy and know what we're really asking of staff. Um, and um, I'm wondering, are we asking um, our, our staff to not only, we're clearly asking them to have the, the two um, initial um, vaccinations or one, depending on which uh, company you, know, you have a vaccination from, whether it's um, Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson & Johnson. But, and then we ask for the most up-to-date booster and so that's my question is, so I'm, I'm gonna give, I'll use myself as example. Um, so I've had my, you know, my two initials and then the booster several months at whatever the requirement was, but I know there's a new booster that's out. And so my question is, are we asking people to get the, the another booster? Or if it's in their primary you know, series, they would get 
their primary uh, vaccination, and then the booster would automatically obviously be the one that's out currently. But are we also asking staff to get what I would call a second booster? Can we, could you clarify what, even after reading the website, I was like, I'm not sure is bivalent what I had, the, what we all had the first booster no. or is that a new, no. so, that's, so that is the new booster. So, so, so Jennifer, the, the, no, not everybody could get the booster that you got. You had to be 50 or older and, and, or have various conditions, I think, to get no, the. No, no, I mean, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Oh, you mean the, the yeah, yeah, but yeah, I'm, yeah, no, no, no. This would be the, to be up to date under CDC would be the, the current bivalent booster, um, the Omicron specific booster. Okay. I so would say personally, I would not have that language in the policy to be up to date and that you have to have the most recent vaccinate the most recent booster i don't know any other schools who are requiring that some schools have kind of left the requirement for vaccination alone i know that newton is still requiring the primary series that would be my recommendation that we still want to have staff uh, what we used to call fully vaccinated versus up to date. Fully vaccinated with the primary series is what I would recommend. I think we could also have language that we strongly encourage staff to stay up to date, but um, I think it's unmanageable to oversee this. Who's going to enforce it? I got panel four's opinion on it. They think it's unmanageable to have, a, to have us requiring this of staff. I reached out to a couple of hospitals. Boston Children's Hospital does not require their staff to be up to date with the boosters. Beth Israel, I spoke to someone in their HR department who said they do. She didn't know how they enforced it. I talked to a staff member there who said, let me look into that. Oh yes, it is a requirement. It's up to a manager in a department to make sure that it's happening. Nobody has the bandwidth to do that. So I would rather not have something in here that we can't do. So uh, Trish, I have a question about, on that because we were able to manage it for the original series by creating a form and we went through a whole policy whereby people would just upload their, their card. So I'm wondering why it's unmanageable for the same number of staff well, yeah. the, the most recent, it's it's going to be a the what is required or what is available will continue to change. Yeah. What um, you are eligible for is dependent on different things. It's your age, your last vaccination. So there's there's an algorithm that goes to it. Um, That's not true. Right now, there's only one. They would only give you the the bivalent if you. But going by CDC. There's they they don't give you they don't give you the option of getting the old booster anymore. Well, that that's true. That is true. It's for I think uh, ages five and up. It's it's just a bivalent. It's still when you got your last uh, vaccination. There's so much time in between. If you had COVID, there's still time. I think it's a lot to expect of our HR department. And I think especially when hospitals are not even doing it. I think that we're setting ourselves apart. I value, I think we should all get it. We are hosting monthly, if not twice a month vaccine clinics. Nurses are working at these to help the company uh, get a lot of people through them. I value it. I just don't know that I would personally put this in a policy beyond the primary series. So Harvard is mandating it um, and they are a much larger institution than we are. Um, but my question is, assuming what happens last year happens this year and we come back from Thanksgiving and the winter break with surges. What's the plan if we don't have, if we're not doing masks and we're not doing updated boosters, what's our, what's I our plan? We're encouraging boosters. I think we are very much encouraging them. I just don't know that I would mandate them. So I, I see that as a different thing. We are encouraging masking. If you fall into certain uh, scenarios, you're encouraged and requested to wear a mask. If you're coming back day six through 10 after having COVID, you're back in school, 
or if you are symptomatic, we are asking you to wear a mask. You've tested negative at home, but you're back in school. We are encouraging masks and we're a mask friendly school. Uh, we're still doing all the same encouraging, staying home when sick, all those things we are doing. We have a message going out on Wednesday with all of these reminders. So um, I think we'll still be doing those things. Will any of our, you know, would we ever mandate masks again? Possibly, I don't know that we would. It's in the realm of possibilities. I guess I'm asking what our plan is because we had different tools available to us for free last year. We gave all of our educators and our students rapid tests to take home as an equity measure. We are just talking about equity policy. We gave them all um, tests so that they could test before they came back from breaks. We're gonna do um, that. We're actually in our notice that's going out Wednesday, we're sending two test kits home per child and per staff to test after the Thanksgiving break and again after the winter holiday break. So that Sunday night, Monday morning. So those tests will be going out, uh, what day is today? They could go out by the end of this week or early next week. Okay. Thank you. They'll be available at the high school starting Wednesday, I think. So is that then, so I'm sorry, so for staff, is that for staff or staff and students? Staff and students. Staff who want them and we're sending them home with all pre-K through eighth grade students and we'll have them available in different locations at the high school for all students. Thanks. All right, what do other members think about whether to make it mandatory to maintain full vaccination as in requiring boosters or to make it recommended? Jennifer? So I would, um, I would recommend, my, my feeling is to do the um, primary series and, and a booster, but I don't know that I would increase it to a second booster. Sorry, the dog is. Just, oh. um, so that that's my feeling is that I I don't know that I would add it. I and I know not a lot of places are requiring it. I heard Val say that yes, um, Harvard is. They're a much larger institution, but they also have a different funding structure than we do. So I don't know that we have someone who could. It is a lot to manage. People are in different stages of this. So I think. I'm comfortable with the, the primary series and a booster. Um, I don't know that I would require like every booster that comes up. I, don't, I just, if Trish is saying that it's a lot to manage, um, that's, that's what I'm comfortable with. Do we have some idea as to how frequently boosters come out? Because maybe another way to handle it would be one booster per year. If there's one each year, if this ends up being similar to uh, flu vaccines? Well, we don't require flu vaccines either, though. So, I mean, we're, I, I don't know. I, I'm just, I don't know. Any other thoughts? I, uh, I guess I'll share, David, that this seems to me fluid enough for us to give discretion to the superintendent and not try to fix it in a policy. That's my thinking right now. All right, so that would sound to be more on the recommended side. And if that's going to switch, then the superintendent can switch it. Val, are you fine with that as well? It's My sense was that you would like to keep it mandatory. I would, I think it's safer. Um, it, you know, I also think we should <laughs> require the flu vaccine, but we don't. Um, I mean, if you just look at RSV and all these other things that are going through and, and absolutely killing emergency departments and hospitals, I, I think as a public health matter, we're, I'm not saying Brookline schools, but, you know, we broadly are not doing our part um, and mm -hmm. hospitals are overwhelmed because of it. Um, that said, I, I, I am okay with a recommendation, strong recommendation. Um, and then I really want to hear from Linus about what the plan is for when we see the surge that is bound to 
come if you just look at what's been happening in Europe over the last eight to 12 weeks. All right, so what I will do is modify the maintain full vaccination language to a recommendation and uh, then move that we refer these revisions to the full school committee. Is there a second? Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer, your vote? Yes. Valerie? Yes. Steven? Yes. And I also vote yes. All right, so next up we have discussion of the yearbook policy. I put this back onto our agenda because there is a principal who reached out to me and wanted some guidance on how to handle some situations, uh, particularly around student privacy, students in DCF custody, and uh, just did not feel that the policy was specific enough to address those concerns. Uh, my response to that principle was that this would be where procedures would come into place that would spell out uh, what it is that we envisioned for the policy. I'm not sure that the district has promulgated such procedures at this time, which may be part of the problem. Uh, so I'm just wondering what other subcommittee members feel. Do we want to be more specific in the yearbook policy, sort of nudge district leadership a bit to come up with some procedures? Before my time on school committee, but my recollection, David, was that you worked really hard, you and others on the subcommittee worked really hard to get to that policy. So my first inclination is to nudge the district on what the procedures are, because it, it did come about. Again, my exact date dating on it is a little bit hazy, but it, it did come about, I think, when they were, you know, like in the middle of four different superintendent transitions. And so it the the procedure piece likely got a little bit lost in the shuffle. So I, I, I think that perhaps pushing on the administration on that to me as the first line makes sense because it, it reads as a really strong policy from my perspective. Right, Jennifer? Yeah, I, I agree. I'm not gonna repeat everything Val just said, but we, we did work really hard. It's a one of our more recently updated policies. Um, and there were some you know, really good reasons for updating that policy. I feel like it's in a good spot and I would really like to maybe sort of check in with the district and see where they're at with those. And some of those are, are really specific. We can't, we, I don't think that we'll ever capture every possible you know, issue that comes up in a policy. And that's really where we rely on those procedures. So I would, I would recommend that we get some more information from the district or a nudge or however we want to call it from on what the procedures are and, um, and have folks in the district work together. Um, just to note, one of the, one of the things was making sure everyone's in, and, you know, there's so many, there are so many pieces to that. And we came up with a, what I thought was a pretty good policy around that to support, um, to support that. And I think specific issues should really come in the procedures part. All right, anyone else? I don't have anything to add. Okay, then that brings us to new business. And Jennifer, you had some questions. Um, I just, I'll pull up the minutes again from um, that we approved. And I just, sorry, I just have to scroll down. Here they are. Um, I just wanted to check in on a, a couple of things. Um, let's see, we, we're talking about the vaccination policy. Oh, uh, here it is. The um, discussion on television and newspaper media coverage. I just wanted to see, I think we've covered town meeting warrant articles. Uh, there's something under new business. Just wanted to see if there was, if you had an update perhaps, David, on what our next piece of work might be with those conversations with big or with the district um, around that body of work. And I don't know if I, I did miss one full school committee meeting due to illness. And so I don't know if there was any um, more work with the zero emissions board or something that's in there as well. So I just was hoping we could just get a quick update on where those are at to move the work forward. All right. So with regards to big, I actually uh, received an email from the director of big just this morning. And uh, she indicated that she's closer to having an MOU draft that she would like to review with the district. Uh, so I'm going to be um, meeting with Dr. Guillory as well as the director of BIG.
to try to put that together. Whether that ends up necessitating a policy, I think I'll have a better idea uh, as to that after our meeting to see whether the MOU would be sufficient. Uh, Stephen, do you have an update on Zboard? No, just that they agreed to, they released that communication right away and they're willing to bring to the full ZAB committee any further statement we'd like to release as well. Okay. And then another matter that we had discussed at the last policy meeting was the review of parental notification, re uh, sex education. And my recollection, uh, Jennifer, was that there was going to be a curriculum subcommittee meeting to discuss the adolescence curriculum. And then depending on how that goes, we might modify the existing policy. And I think that um, Dr. Litaz was here with us at our last policy meeting. We did we did have a discussion at curriculum, uh, like initial discussion of you know sort of where some of the changes are and and uh, in the introduction to adolescent curriculum, adolescence curriculum, and we were there was a question about whether or not we would like update this policy. There was a note about maybe taking out the letter. Do we intend to? sort of update, like, I don't think Dr. Litas didn't write, recommend that we make any significant changes to the policy. She actually thought that the policy went above and beyond um, the, what, what is actually laid out in like um, mass general law, I think is the, is the body. But we were thinking about whether or not we should look at it and just maybe make some sort of fine tune edits and re-vote it. Um, in the just in the vein of making sure that all of our policies are updated and current. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm one, my question is what I'm wondering is, are we intending to revote this policy? I think it would make sense for us to revote it. Yes, I'm going to reach out to Dr. Litas to see if she has some specific suggestions for any slight modifications. Uh, same for you. If you think, Jennifer, that there's anything that we should change. Uh, after having that discussion about adolescent education, it sounds like we don't have to make any major modifications, but it would be good to reaffirm that policy. I'd be happy to reach out to um, to um, Leslie Ryan Miller and um, Carlin Wyanoma, just who was the um, director of the curriculum coordinator for our health and wellness, and just check in with them and see if they. Um, have any recommendations on a change of language or anything that's in there. But I, I'm, I felt like after Dr. Lita's looking at it, she felt like it was in really good shape. So I think I was the one who maybe in the notes, it says about maybe taking out the letter. And that might be at this point, that's my only recommendation on it um, is to maybe take out the sample letter unless people felt strongly that it should be in there. But again, it's sort of one of those detail pieces. I'm not sure it needs to be in the policy manual, um, but uh, I'll be happy to, I have a the sample letter to families, Jennifer. Yeah. I'm not even sure it's the actual fam. The last time that policy was voted was quite some time ago. So uh, probably. I, know, I, I have to say I've gotten more health letters for seventh grade health this year than I ever thought imaginable. For yeah. And I just got an eighth grade one. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually was wondering if there was, and this is again, a procedural thing, if there's a way to streamline sending these out even at the beginning of the year like this is what's gonna this is what your child will be covering this year um then again then you have students who enter school like i don't know if it's part of our enrollment pack i don't know I, that's outside yeah. yeah but um it's important that we do it and that it's implemented um and i think this is something that we could easily update and, and i i think i don't know david what the date was the last time we looked at it but it was a while ago and if we're looking at it, we should revote it and reaffirm it and make any minor edits and, and it will be updated. So I will I will check in with um, with Leslie Ryan Miller and with um, Carlin or, or ask Leslie to facilitate that and see if I can get us any feedback. All right, we last uh, upvoted that policy in 1997. So it has been a while. All right, is there any other new business? So a little bit of new business I'll raise, although it's more of a scheduling matter. Val, I want, I'm not sure what you have planned for the agenda for DEIJ, uh, but we might want to consider having a joint DEIJ policy meeting if we're going to continue to work on the equity policy. Uh, we could do that. 
we were going to discuss also um, MCAS, but I, I think that that is going to take longer than, I mean, I think we're making good strides on the policy and, and should probably continue to work through it. Okay, so we don't have to decide that now. I just wanted to put that on your radar. Mm -hmm. Are you talking? Are you talking about just looking at the MCAS data, Val? Or are you talking about a policy around MCAS data? No, we were going to have, um, and now I'm blanking on her name. Fund. Yes, um, speak about the changes in um, in MCAS requirements and disparities in graduation and impact and things like that. Um, with respect to what the Department of Ed voted just this last within this these last twelve months uh, in terms of changing graduation requirements. And who was that person again? I uh, I lost the connection there. Lisa Geisman. She's done a lot of uh, advocacy around MCAS. She runs an advocacy uh, organization. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, CPS. Okay, that's great. Okay. So it was a broader on um, test standardized testing for graduation requirements and disproportionate impact. Great, that's great. I don't. When do you think you were, do you have like a potential? Sorry, I'm diverging here. I'm like. So it was going to be at our December meeting, but I think it, it will now go to our January meeting. Okay. All right. That's maybe we could maybe we could even do something jointly with curriculum with curriculum because I missed your yeah numbers yeah. yeah that and that that was really there was a lot of really interesting information in that but I, I think that's coming to full committee so um so we'll get a deeper dive there but you know perhaps we could also schedule something um yeah I mean the committee was meant to be sort of interdisciplinary so to speak so I think a January with curriculum would be great and then December with policy so that we can continue working on the policy would be um if that works for for both of you but we can take that offline and discuss dates okay any other new business Janae while we still have you here and thank you for staying for the entirety of the meeting uh are there any policy issues that you feel that we should be taking up as a body oh um that's um wow that's a good question um, I don't have a ready answer for you, David. Can I think about that? Because I, I think so. <laughs> Let me think about it. Okay. All right. Well, if that wraps it up for new business, then that's the end of our meeting. So thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Have a good night.